as, as a tool. And, but I don't put all my eggs in the basket mm-hmm. there. I put, I put 98% of my eggs in the basket on most days, but mm. I do have my, my other practices. But the, the question of how to, how to be a Buddhist or how to not be a Christian, for example, in 12 step is, is, is my most common question. So I addressed that pretty clearly in the steps uh, that I wrote in the 12 step Buddhist. Step two, three, seven, eleven, you know, deal directly with a higher power question. Mm-hmm. And I look at that in terms of um, some simple, some simple kind of tools that you know that we hear about in twelve step. But um, you know, these are some things that are pretty commonplace now in, in most spiritual bookstores and, and things like that. You can find a lot of a lot of books on how to be uh, present in the moment and. Uh, how to uh, be mindful and that sort of thing. So uh, there's a real, there's a real simple way you can make your higher power the present moment. Mm. What is, what is, mm-hmm. surrender to what is right now. And uh, if you can surrender to what is right now without, as my teacher says, changing or modifying anything, look, mm-hmm. don't over, don't overlook, don't overlook. It's a simple practice, but don't overlook the profound nature of being able to absolutely surrender to what is. In this moment, whether whether or not that this moment sucks and is full of suffering, right. or whether or not everything's going your way, and that's the trick. So there's there are ways that I look at in the book. I'm I'm looking at uh, a higher power, pra- practicing principles. A principle is a higher truth, a higher power. Um, using the help of obviously of the twelve step group. That's common common thing that said, use the group as your higher power. Mm. But I go in later on into Tibetan Buddhist practices, deity, deity yoga practices like Green Tara, Green Tara and, uh, and uh, Guru Rinpoche and, and so forth, the seven line supplication to Padmasambhava and these sorts of things that are real common in, in you know, many Tibetan Buddhist uh, schools. So there are ways to, you know, take it into you know, practicing guru yoga and things like this, but really the simplest, there are simple approaches that are, you know, really powerful. And, and I think when we start to understand the essence, I mean, this is where, where, you know, my teachers come from the perspective of, look, I mean, we don't really have time in one right now, if we're just going to spend the rest of our lifetime, we really have time to master all of the all the scriptural knowledge that there is out there. So let's get into the essence, get into the essence of what, and the power of what we're talking about, and really not to strip it down, mm-hmm. but to take away anything that's superfluous, and let's look at really what's happening. And, you know, this mm-hmm. is what Zen, this is what Zen is all about. You know, Zen is about the direct experience of this mm-hmm. present moment. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, boom, you know, you can have a, uh, you know, a little awakening or a, a big awakening or something, but, uh, you know, then you got to, then you gotta get up off your cushion and go deal with your dead battery or your, um, <laughs> right. or your divorce or yeah. your, your layoff or your stock portfolio or your cancer or, or your kids, drug addiction. So, you know, this is, uh, these are powerful practices that we can use, but the, the mentality of the addict is so unique, I think, in that it's an extreme version of attachment. You know, in Buddhist practice, we, we talk about attachment and, uh, you know, latching on to things that we think are going to provide happiness. And, you know, we find out inevitably that, you know, um, it didn't. It didn't. The new car, the new this, the, the, right. the various meal, the various clothing, the the status, the prestige, and 12-step, we call it money, property, prestige, you know, sex, uh, gambling, uh, anything we can get addicted to, food, uh, mm. power, all these things, you know, none of, it really, none of it really results in happiness, but we get attached and we cling to it as if our life depends on it. So, and the idea that I like to work with is that, you know, Addiction is attachment gone wild. Yeah. You know, the, the addict is the extreme case of if you really play out the attachment. So they say to play out the next drunk before you go take the drink, you know, play it out and, and see what the sequence of events will be. If you look at the basic attachment of all sentient or all conscious beings, every every being, you know, has this uh, ignorance, attachment, and aversion. And uh, to various degrees, you know, the animals are clearly not, you know, conscious and looking like they have a choice to get out of some sorrow or the infinite cycle of, you know, birth, mm-hmm. sickness, old age, death, suffering, rebirth, 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 ad infinitum. 
right you know, forever but you know they're, they're still they're still instinctually in their dna and their program they're still driven to attachment they're driven to survive and so forth so these patterns are there and you look at all this in terms of the eyes of the addict you can see what buddha was talking about life is suffering you can see it so clearly you know suffering arises from you know desire and attachment and mm. anger and the you know the pocket poisons and emotion you know different emotional you know constructs and so on so we start to look at these things and then you go back into 12 step it's like so crystal clear you can't even deny it i mean mm. the 12 step meetings become so rich because it's a fertile it's, mm. a, it's, a, it's a field of of spiritual potential and it's just popping. I mean, you go into meeting, you do some meditation practice, some yoga practice, you study Dharma, you you do your meditation groups and so on. You come into a 12-step meeting and you look at the people. Some people are struggling, but there's so many miracles happening every moment. It's like mm-hmm. instantaneously, there's like enlightenment experience just crackling in the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And it's so rich, you know, that there's no way to get bored or feel stagnant. Mm. In twelve step recovery, you go in there and say, Wow, this is this is really the, the Sangha or the spiritual community where I need to do my work and mm-hmm. my work isn't out there trying to like um you know, hustle people or prophetize or sell them some Buddhist practice or something, but my work is to be a benefit, you know, somehow help. Somehow right. not be a narcissistic, self centered, self absorbed jerk and to go out there and really try to make a difference and make somebody feel better somehow, you know. And um, so anyways, I found that these practices are really closely interrelated. And I, I kind of uh, created this, this voice dialoguing um, application, which was taken from uh, the original, uh, you know, some Jungian archetype stuff that uh, oh, Hellstone invented. That. And it was called, you know, voice dialogue in the 80s. And then, you know, Genpo Roshi, kind of a controversial figure, but he started working with it for... Um, then students and I just said, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply this to addiction. And we started doing these. Uh, you know, I trained, I trained somewhat with Kempo Roshi on some of his retreats and asking questions and trying things out and working with a, another Zen teacher and another, another therapist. And over time, I, you know, I wouldn't say perfected the technique, but the technique is always evolving. But it's a really neat way to apply um, psychological principles and you know archetypal. Uh, knowledge, which you know, crosses a lot of genres, a lot of things like shamanism, and psychology, mm-hmm. psychotherapy, mm-hmm. and uh, recovery, and so on. So you start to speak from the voice, for example, of the addict, you know, and you you take it out of the shadows, and you allow the addict to have its voice, and you want to start to understand some things, like one like one shaman told me, you know, the addict is really the addict on one hand, on one end is a really perverted and sick um, uh, version of the healer. Because the addict's trying to, the addict's trying to, you know, heal the pain, you know, right. but 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 he doesn't know how because all he knows is, you know, grab the next fix, you know, grab the next drink, <laughs> and, uh, and and if you take a look at what happens in healing, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, and try to integrate and give the addict a little bit of um, food for thought and a little bit of airtime mm-hmm. and a little bit of way to come out and play without dominating the personality then so some of these types of you know practices we do and talk about the these various types of um, archetypes or, or aspects of self as I, I try to call it something like that you know aspects of self which is um, uh, applicable to Buddhist terminology applicable to recovery you know applicable to anyone's life really so I mean that's why I think that's why I wrote that book for everybody I, I feel like anybody who wants to know anything about anything should study Buddhism because it's a science of the mind it's not a religion it can be religious if you want you know some people some people make things religious but really right. honest, honestly it's actually just a, it's just really a science of understanding the mind and, and, and experience and to you know, move out of suffering into happiness and and you start to look at that Buddhist technology through the eyes of the addict, it becomes crystal clear. Mm-hmm. And then if you're and if you're in recovery and you want to look at spiritual development, you can take what they do in twelve step 
um, further because, you know, there's a way to achieve enlightenment, the enlightenment of the Buddha, you know, complete omniscience, absolute free, total liberation, to never return to suffering. These are the promises, you know, and if you, like if you go to an AA meeting, you know, they always have the promises, you know, Buddhism has a promise to you can become Buddha. You're already Buddha, and mm. depending on what schools you talk to, some will say you have Buddha potential, some will say you're already Buddha, some will say, you know, you can get there for, if you practice for 10 million lifetimes or whatever, but it, you know, depend. The point is, is that they don't really address this in twelve step. And although in twelve step we talk about having the, uh, we be quick to see where religious people are right. I don't, I don't think they delineate it between religious and spiritual so much in that. But you know, look to the world. The libraries are filled. Or we realize we know only a little. Um, you know, uh, we go out and try to explore the rich. Um, you know, field of information and practices that are out there. And then, you know, as an addict, knowing that, look, if my DNA ever changes, if I become so spiritually developed that I can really demonstrate, if you read something like, you know, autobiography of a yogi, and you, you can understand if you read some of the practices of Mahasiddhas, you know, biographies of Mahasiddhas, you know, great enlightened practitioners in India and so forth. I mean, they really become magical feats, you know, people walk mm -hmm. through walls, they teleport, they're, they're clairvoyant. There's a lot of things. And if I get to that point, you know, I might could be able to take a drink again, you know, but I, pro I probably should talk to my sponsor first. <laughs> right. You know, yeah, because the only, the only way I can prove myself, the only way I can prove that I'm so enlightened that I can drink again is to take a drink. And if I'm wrong, then I lose my 5,000 days. <laughs> I got to start all over. So all I'm saying is that I, I stay in the mindset of the addict because it's a helpful way to practice and it keeps me sober. And I practice my Buddhism, and I do it within 12-step meetings, just within myself. I don't talk about Buddhism in meetings. Right, but, right, you know, right. But I know when I go in, I know when they say, God, this is God's will, I translate that to, okay, God's will. Okay, compassion, absolute compassion, yeah. bodhicitta, you know, the kind of, uh, the kind of abandonment of self, uh, for others. Okay. God's will is probably that. You call it God's will. I call it bodhicitta. It's okay. I don't have to argue. I don't have to prove a point. I don't have to tell the Christians that they're wrong or whatever. I mean, we're all in the same boat, you know, exactly. and I can, yeah. You know, Okay. Yes, and, and uh, I'm sure that the the uh, the, uh, act, the act the practice of being mindful, mindfulness, is very helpful in staying present to the moment and and seizing opportunities and the synchronicities that go on uh, as a result of our uh, continued ch continually changing our uh, choices, which make uh, which provide better choices and. That, as I see it, that takes us on a whole new path that we've never been on before. That makes sense. Now, um, I have some questions for uh, for you because not everybody is up to speed with all of this, and there are going to be people listening who might not uh, know that they have a problem, might be wondering if they have a problem. Um, how can one determine? If one has a problem, especially if the, the relatives and so on are, are are not saying anything or they're afraid to say something, I mean, what what uh, what would you suggest for people who are are actually beginning to wonder that question? Well, this is an excellent question, and I've I've answered it about ten thousand times in my life because <laughs> I get a lot of I get a lot of questions like, what do I do about my son? He's in he's in prison. He won't take his meds, and he's yeah. addicted. He's addicted. Or what do I do about my this or my whoever? Yeah. And, and and you know, we if it's the family member, if it's the individual, you know, I mean, basically, I think I wrote that book so that if you read that book, you're going to understand what the nature of addiction is in a very very clear way. Uh -huh. You're going to understand what the games are and what the solutions are and if you read the 12-step literature like the Narcotics Anonymous it works how and why the Alcoholics Anonymous basic text the Al-Anon books you know the maybe read the sex addiction and the gambling uh, and, and all these you know you can go online and get all this stuff mm -hmm. you know go to some meetings I mean but basically the the, the question is you know I, I, I look at addiction I think uh, 
it's fairly common nowadays to think of addiction. Uh, not necessarily if you go to like a pure alcoholic anonymous meeting. It's a little bit, you know, single-mindedness of purpose with that. But I mean, I look at addiction as a, any process event, substance, or person that one becomes attached to to the point where, despite consequences, we're going to keep on doing what we're doing. And uh, we feel like we can stop, but we can't stop. And then we have remorse, and then we go back. 